with uh, that and then uh, share screen. Um, okay, so I'll give you a, a minute or so to write this down if you want. Um, All right, well, I guess I can't move that. Okay. Um, oops. Okay, um, anyway, um, good morning. Um, what I've got planned today, we'll see uh, how far we get. I'm having some problems with my laptop, so I can't distribute my screens the way I want to. So if I'm going back and forth, um, hopefully. Are you seeing the shared screen, the whiteboard? OK, good. Um, that's all that really matters. Um, so my plan uh, today is to um, do a lot of um, what's in complex, in, in this chapter on complex analysis, um, through uh, the residue theorem and how we can use that to do intervals. So um, by way of overview, as I started doing uh, last time, the ideas are ultimately how can we define and expand um, series in the complex plane? And what happens when analyticity fails? Remember, analyticity is essentially an expression of the existence of a derivative in a region. Um, and we, we kind of left off with the Cauchy theorem in order, in order to do that. The applications, which will become more obvious in terms of a physical sense later, is that we'll be able to um, basically transform integrals into algebraic equations and then the the other the other mathematical part of this is this is a, a way to simplify intractable um, classes of integrals from a physics standpoint and we may get there today we may not um, this is especially important for Fourier transforms which you would have seen as I mentioned last time in quantum and certainly is a part of things like optics um, so Today may be a little more um, abstract, but I'll try and do as many uh, examples as possible. Um, I've been kind of combing through the books I have here and I have to venture onto campus to collect some more books to fill out um, some more physical examples. And, and we'll get to a little bit of that near the end of class when we do the reflection. I have a bit of a different idea for that today. So is everybody ready? Sorry, I'm looking off over here. You're over here. Camera's over here. All right, good. All right. So um, we'll start with uh, complex series. Oh, I didn't want that. Uh, I guess I'm stuck with that. There we go. And um, what I want to accomplish, and sorry if I, what I want to accomplish uh, with this section is something that the book kind of skips over in like one sentence. Um, and that is defining what complex series are and in particular regions in which they um, converge. And then if they converge, how do we use them? This eventually sets up the Laurent uh, series. Um, so what we're interested in again are uh, infinite series. And here, uh, these are infinite series of uh, complex uh, numbers. Uh, so we can define, for example, partial sums. S sub n would be equal to the partial sum of the real part plus the partial sum 
of the imaginary part. Um, this implies also uh, convergence testing, which we'll spend a little bit of time on. Um, we can use the straightforward uh, definition for uh, convergence, that is that as n goes to infinity, uh, our partial sums go to uh, the complete sum, that is uh, x plus i y. And then in terms of tests, um, this is essentially as uh, we talked about in one point B uh, for positive terms. Uh, because of the nature of, of complex variables, uh, we're often stuck with looking at absolute convergence. Uh, so for example, and, and often what we look at are um, either a comparison test or uh, a ratio test. So um, let's get an example. Um, the complex series, the complex series, one, one plus i to the n over two to the n. If we look at what that, that looks like, that's one plus, uh, uh, one plus i over two plus one plus i squared over four and so on. So if we look at the limit as n goes to infinity of we take a ratio uh, one plus ratio test one plus i to the n plus one over one plus i to the n and then two n over two n plus one. That equals the limit from n as n goes to infinity of one plus i over two. That equals root two because we're looking at the absolute value. So we're take, looking at the, the magnitude of that number. Um, that's less than one. So this converges. Um, another uh, case would be um, an infinite uh, sum of say z sub n, where we're looking at from n equals one to infinity of i to the n over the square root of n. Um, you'll notice uh, that we've got, uh, this is a little bit different from the first case uh, because what we end up having in this sequence is i minus one over root two minus i over root three plus one over root four plus i over root five, minus one over root six. It's a little bit more complicated, so uh, we can break that up into a real part, one minus, or uh, minus one over root two, plus one over root four, minus one over root six, and so on, plus one minus one over root three, plus one over root five, times i. And what you should recognize is that both of these are uh, forms of the alternating uh, harmonic series. And so both, both converge. So z sub n converges. So the last thing here is if you have a series uh, in order for it to um, converge, both the real and the imaginary parts have to converge. Pretty straightforward. All right. Um, <clears throat> the, the last thing I, I wanna do sort of as preamble before we get to the stuff that the book talks about uh, are complex power series. So with complex power series, uh, 
we have the usual definition, except now um, we're dealing with z. So f of z is equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of a sub n z to the n uh, with z equal to x plus i y and those coefficients complex. So they could be pure imaginary, pure real, but they're at least uh, complex. On the surface, this looks uh, exactly the same as what we've dealt with before, and there are certainly many um, similarities. But now, uh, because we're dealing with the complex plane, we have to uh, define uh, the circle and radius of convergence. So let's look at f of z is equal to, uh, say, zn over n. Uh, we can define uh, the radius of convergence in terms of the limit as n goes to infinity, again, uh, using a ratio test. So zn plus 1 over z and then n over over n plus 1. My phone's ringing, sorry. Okay. It's, yes, it's always sunny. Um, <laughs> uh, that means there's a package coming, which means you get to hear my dogs uh, absolutely lose their shit in a few minutes. So uh, anyway, this is um, not working. Okay, this is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of z times n plus n over one, which is the absolute value of z. Um, now that doesn't do a lot for us. Um, what we're trying to extract from this from a convergence series is the limit as n goes to infinity of these terms, a, oh my God, stop it. Uh, a plus one over a to the n, we're gonna def define as the reciprocal of uh, the radius of convergence. Um, so what that means is uh, we can find, in, in the first case, uh, the radius of convergence here is all z. So this is convergent throughout the um, uh, complex plane. Uh, if we look at another example using uh, this definition of, uh, of r, say f of z is equal to the sum of i z to the n over z factorial. That's equal to the sum of i to the n over n factorial z to the n. And it's pretty straightforward to show that uh, this limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n is equal to i z over n plus 1. That equals 0. That means this series converges for all z. In essence, we're kind of talking about uniform convergence again, right? Um, we're looking at the conditions in which uh, the, the function converges for those, um, for the variable z. Um, another example, last example, before we get into uh, the meat of the lecture, let's look at the sum of n equals zero to infinity of z plus one minus i to the n over three n n squared. I know, rather abstract, um, but these toy problems do um, give us something to play with. Our radius then is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of z plus one
minus i over 3. Uh, sorry, I don't know what's going on. Ah! All right. Let's try this again. This is equal to z plus 1 minus i over 3 times n squared over n plus 1 squared. And so that's z plus 1 minus i over 3. Okay. So what do we do with that? Um, well, we see that z plus 1 minus i is less than 3. Right? Um, or another way of writing that is that z minus minus 1 plus i is less than 3. How do we interpret that? Um, this series is um, convergent um, in a radius, in a, in a circle that's centered on minus 1 plus i and has a radius of 3. Okay, so the series is convergent in this region and divergent outside this region. So that's our radius and our circle of convergence for a power series, for a complex power series. Okay. Uh, we good? Oh, it's actually something about the uh, the poll worker who used my driver's license as a mouth shield. So that's good. I don't know if you saw that. When I went to vote last week, um, I used uh, my cell phone bill to show that I had residence and she took my driver's license and went like that to ask somebody a question. No, no, nothing. So I reported her to the election board. So if I'm sick in a week, you know why. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, on to uh, the cool stuff. And that is the Laurent expansion. Um, basically, the I keep pointing over here. Basically, the idea is we started this class, and this is the reason why I designed the class this way, with um, looking at infinite series and then from that developing things like, or at least examining again, things like the Taylor expansion, the Corn series, and the binomial expansion. Now we're looking at uh, complex numbers. And because of the peculiarities of um, analyticity with uh, complex numbers, we can't just use blindly a Taylor expansion. Um, so we know um, if everything's kosher that we can define a Taylor expansion. And this is where your book picks up with um, this stuff. So the Taylor expansion for a complex uh, series or a function is the sum from n equals zero to infinity of z minus z naught to the n, and then times the nth derivative evaluated at z naught over n factorial. Right? And then obviously the Maclaurin uh, version of that is when z naught is equal to zero. Right? Um, we can also do a binomial expansion. And this actually becomes ex incredibly important. Um, where we have 1 plus z to the m is equal to 1 plus mz plus the usual m minus m1 to z squared up to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of m over n z to the n. Okay. Um, and this is 4m real. And importantly, 
z less than one. This will inform how we do this uh, Laurent expansions, uh, this condition right here. Um, okay, so that's not incredibly weird. Um, but as I said, we have to be careful when we deal with uh, complex numbers. So um, we're going to consider the following. Uh, functions that are analytic in an annular region Uh, with uh, radii little r and capital R and center at z equals z naught. Um, then we're going to let our function f of z be analytic on or in this region between little r and big R. Um, if that's true, we can write our function f of c as the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of a sub n z minus z naught to the n. Okay, and This is our key expansion. This is the Laurent expansion, and, and I would draw attention in particular to the difference between this and the other expansions that we've looked at, namely that uh, this is a sum over negative um, values of n. And the idea, again, is that um, you would have some value z naught um, that's bounded by little r in another region, capital R. And you are essentially, and there's some point Z in between those regions, some arbitrary point Z in those regions. Um, you're essentially, your job is to integrate along a contour Right, so that we're back to contour intervals that captures that z and avoids those two uh, boundaries. But we still want to ask in these regions what happens here, what happens here, and what happens here. Okay. All right. So um, this is the idea, which I'm not going to. Uh, the, the proof is in your book. It's not particularly enlightening. Um, the other key part to this is that a sub n is equal to 2 pi i times this contour interval of f of z prime dz prime over z prime minus z naught to the n plus 1, where those z primes are, are dummy variables. Um, you, you can also write this in terms of um, positive and negative um, summations. That is, um, we'll, we'll stick to this, uh, but your book does mention, so Arfkin at least mentions um, using A prime and B prime, where you can have a series that's over, um, positive infinity values in a series that's over negative, that is positive n and negative n. Um, this becomes uh, important because of uh, the residue theorem. The residues for these things are uh, the value of a minus one. Okay, this should look somewhat familiar. If we're breaking it, we're doing an expansion, we're breaking them up into two different kinds of terms. Um, Anybody want to take a guess what this looks like? Or what does it resemble? It's 
something you've seen before in another class, certainly. They even had coefficients a sub n and b sub n. Fourier transforms. Yeah, <laughs> or, uh, well, or Fourier series. If you think back to um, E and M, um, that's, you know, we cut out these both sine series and cosine series, right? So now we're cutting this out into basically, um, z to the n series and z to or one over z to the n series and that's how we're going to um, uh, approximate this function i just noticed the tom is upside down okay all right if that works um awesome uh let's see before i get to an example i do want to mention a connection to uh, the Cauchy interval. That is, if we look at f of z is equal to 1 over 2 pi i times f of z over z minus z naught to the dz. That's just something that we've, we've seen before. Right. What I would ask you to note is we can write z 1 over z minus z naught in a particular way. What can we do with that? Exponential form? Um, not an exponential form, but if, say, um, let's look at the case for, let's say, for z naught over z is less than 1. What would your physics intuition tell you you should do with that function? You did on the homework last week. Right, this is just another way of saying z minus c naught to the minus one. Binomial expansion. Right, so we do a binomial expansion. In fact, um, what we would do is write this as one over z times uh, one minus z naught over z to the minus one, because z naught is less than z. And so that, e that equals one over z times one plus z naught over z uh, plus half z naught over z squared and so on, right? Um, on the other hand, if z naught over z is greater than one, how would we write this? You would factor out a one over z naught instead and do the right. same thing. Right, so you factor over the, the z naught. So now this is equal to one over z naught times one plus z naught over z plus one half z naught over z squared and so on. So um, the reason why I bring this up is that eventually we're going to be using this and trying to identify where uh, these this uh, series terminates either at the beginning or at the end. Often with, um, if we, in uh, real analysis, what we're looking for is can we terminate the binomial series at the end, right, on the right side. But now that we're in complex, uh, we're dealing with complex series, we're looking to see if it can terminate at positive values and negative values. And in particular, of particular importance is the A minus one value. Um, so uh, one quick example, um, well, maybe two. One easy example, I hope. F of z 
is equal to one over z times z minus, oops, z minus one. Um, here we have z naught uh, equals zero, and uh, basically we're letting little r be greater than zero and big R uh, less than one. Okay. So uh, I think it's clear that we have uh, singular points at zero and one. We can break this f of z um, into partial fractions one over, uh, minus one over z minus one over one minus c. So that equals one minus one over z minus one plus z plus so on. So that equals uh, minus one over, minus uh, one over z minus the sum n equals zero to infinity of z to the n. Another way of writing that is minus the sum from minus one to infinity of z to the n. Okay. And this is for z less than one. And what we notice is that a, a sub n in this case is going to be equal to minus one for n greater than or equal to one and zero otherwise. Um, the key thing here is that by doing the series expansion, um, we found the a sub n's uh, without integrating. So if we go back to uh, our first uh, pass at the Laurent, the Laurent series, technically to get those coefficients, we have to do that interval. But if we are clever enough about what our, uh, how we do that expansion, we can find what those coefficients are. So um, it's often easier to get A's from the expansion than from the actual interval itself. Um, a somewhat trickier one function would be f of z, let's write f of z, is equal to z over z squared minus 3z plus 2. Okay, and here we know that it's analytic everywhere but where. Where are the two places it's not analytic? Two and one. Yeah, so z equals one and two. And so that sets up essentially our regions. When we want to consider this expansion, we're going to consider essentially uh, d0, d1, d2 where this is z equals one, and this is z equals two, right? Um, inside this region, we can basically do just a Taylor expansion. Inside this region, we have to use the Laurent expansion, okay? Um, now, in order to do this, um, we have to write this. Now, we could use this and then use the integrals uh, to determine what the a sub n's are, but we're better off if we uh, rewrite this in terms of partial fractions plus two. So that's equal to z times one over z squared minus three z plus two, or z um, over z minus one and z minus two. Um, everybody remember how to do partial fractions? No? Been a while? It's okay. 
Um, so just a, a real quick reminder, um, if you've got uh, this, you basically, you if you have something that looks like z minus one, z minus two, you want to construct partial fractions by breaking those up and solving for those a's and b's, right? So um, this would be equal to a times z minus two uh, plus b times z minus one over z minus minus one times z minus two, and then set that equal to z over z minus one, z minus two. Okay. We're going to be using this actually uh, quite a bit in this class. Um, so this allows you to solve for A and B because the numerators have to be equal. If you do that, um, you get, I'll leave that as an exercise, A equals minus one and B equals two. Okay. So, um, what do I call these? All right. So, for the region D zero, right? So that's inside Z equals one. We just have the um, essentially um, an expansion. We don't have to worry about non-analyticity. So we can write, um, and, and we can actually, it's, it's the same difference. We can do a binomial expansion or we can do um, a Taylor expansion. Um, but inside this region, we basically have um, f, f of z is equal to 1 over 1 minus z minus 1 minus z over 2, if you factor out everything. Right. This is just equal to the sum over n equals 0 to infinity of z to the n minus the sum of from n equals zero to infinity of z over two to the n, or the sum of n equals zero to infinity of one minus uh, one over two to the n, z to the n. Okay, and that's all there is to it for inside d zero. Now in d one, That's the annulus. Between one and two. And here uh, we want to factor out the Z. So we have our F of Z is minus one over Z times one minus one over Z and minus one over Z or minus one minus e over two. Actually, we factored out the two in the last part there. Um, this again gives us our, um, our expression it sets up our um, sums from zero to infinity of one over z to the n plus one minus the sum from n equals zero to infinity of z over two to the n. Okay. And um, I'll either, I'll let this for now. Um, uh, as, a, as an exercise for you, um, otherwise I can just, after, um, maybe a couple of days, I'll um, give you a chance to do it. I'll do it as an example. But that's um, <clears throat> the essence of Laurent expansions. Okay. We haven't said why we're gonna do this yet, right? So it's a, it's a little opaque. Um, but the ultimately, uh, the why, comes from uh, being able to do physically interesting uh, integrations. Um, I want to make sure that I'm... So.
threaded throughout all of this is the issue of singularities, right? Singularities are where we lose our analyticity. Um, and so it's useful to uh, define uh, these singularities and uh, what they mean. So um, we know that they are isolated uh, points uh, that are not analytic. Call them Z naught. Um, but uh, what's important is that they're analytic on neighboring sides. Then um, we can define what are called poles. So given f of z as the expansion, in this case uh, with m, from minus infinity to infinity of a sub m times z minus z naught to the m, um, we have Uh, let's see how we want to do this. Yeah. For a minus n not equal to zero, z naught is a pole of order n. That is for some that negative value of n. Okay. Um, we can also define uh, an essential singularity. That's another way of uh, thinking of essential singularities. if you've done the reading. What's the most uh, extreme case of a singularity would be the most um, in, in the way that we're looking at these things right now. So for example, a pole of uh, order one is one over Z, right? So an essential singularity is something that's much more pathological. Um, so essentially, uh, essentially, huh? when you have an infinite number of uh, singularities, that is when M goes to infinity. And that represents a much larger problem. Um, so um, it's basically a pole of order infinity. And um, what we'll notice is that the coefficient a minus one of one over z minus z naught is the what we'll call the residue uh, of f of z at z equals zero, uh, z naught, sorry. Um, and this is going to be play a really important part when we do these, uh, when we transform these different kinds of intervals. Uh, some examples, uh, e to the z, if we just expand this out, what's that equal to? What's, that, what's just our normal Taylor expansion of this? One plus uh, z to the n over n factorial. Right, one plus z plus z squared over two factorial plus z cubed over three factorial. Okay, um, what's the, uh, well, here I'll just start with this, with this example. Um, our a naught is located right here, right? And it has a value of one. 
Here's our A1, um, our A2 is one over two factorial, our A3 is equal one over three factorial. Um, the lesson here is that this, and not surprisingly, this is analytic at z equals zero, and the residue at z equals zero is equal to what? One over z? Um, actually, if you look back at the definition, the residue, and, and you should ask yourselves what is the residue of what? Right, it's the leftover of the positive um, series, the positive n series. So the residue is the coefficient of the uh, the a minus one coefficient. In this case, um, the residue is equal to zero because there's no a minus one term. It's all positive values of n. Um, on the other hand, so sorry, that was a trick question. Um, on the other hand, if we do E Z over Z cubed, right, then we have one over Z cubed. We have the, basically the same thing, but we're dividing by Z cubed. So now we have one over Z cubed, one over Z squared, plus one over two factorial Z, plus one over three factorial plus, and so on. All right, so there's a, a pole of order, three at z equals zero. It's because the maximum value of the um, uh, of the singularity is z cubed. And what's the residue? Is it one half? Yes, it's equal to, perfect, it's equal to uh, one over uh, two factorial. This is a minus three, a minus two, a minus one, a zero, and then a one. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? Um, all right, I know that we're kind of short on, uh, short on time. But I want to get to some kind of payoff. And that is the calculus of residues. So starting with what we, what we set out with, with today's lecture is defining uh, our complex series defining how we can expand a function and now using uh, those expansions. Um, so we'll start with the residue theorem, which is um, first considering uh, a Laurent expansion of f of z. So f of z is equal to the sum from minus infinity to infinity of a sub n z minus z naught to the n. Um, now, we, uh, if we integrated this term by term by using a closed contour and circling um, our singular point once uh, in uh, counterclockwise, so if we have a z naught, um, right, and I'll put our z naught here. And um, we're going to integrate over that. Then we have um, a sub n times the contour interval of z minus z naught to the n dz is equal to a sub n z minus z naught to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 evaluated essentially from z1 to z1, and that equals zero if n is not equal to one, 
minus one. That is, it's analytic. Um, if it's not analytic, then a minus one, which is again our residue, times this integral, z minus c naught to the minus one dz is equal to what? What do we know from the Cauchy um, integral theorem? If something isn't analytic, right? And we take this integral of f of z dz, what do we get from Cauchy? Zero to one? Uh, so remember, if this, is, if this is non analytic, right? This is kind of like the, um, remember I, I, I made a reference to it being kind of like the delta function. So the value of this integral is what? Again, we have it non-analytic at z naught. Z naught. Well, the, the function at z naught, but remember it's two pi i, right, times that value. And if you go back in your notes, but we've already defined what this is in terms of our residue. Um, so this is another way of finding the residue. The residue a minus one, a sub minus one is equal to one over two pi i times the integral of f of z dz. If we have multiple singularities, we then, um, and your book has a nice picture of this, can deform. I have, a, I have a question. Sure. Can you go up a little bit? Yes. Okay. The, the, the like little top bit that you have there where you are doing the integral, the mm -hmm. second line where you're like, it's equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Is it? like the z1 to z1 are they are they both supposed to be z1 um, why are they both z1 yes because we're going in a complete circle oh okay yeah and because cool. this is analytic it's again it's this idea that it's path to independent when you do this uh integration thank you yeah but when it's non-analytic right in other words when it blows up at z naught um you have this nice result from complex analysis that ultimately we can tie to the Laurent expansion. And if there are multiple regions, we can deform our contour around these poles and then shrink the size of those poles. So in other words, um, if there are uh, multiple singularities, or multiple poles, then uh, the contour integral of f of z dz is equal to 2 pi i times the residue uh, for, say, z naught plus the residue for z1 plus, and so on. In other words, it's equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. This is the residue theorem. Um, running out of time here. So one, that means that if we have a function and we uh, have a contour around that function, we want to do that integration. All we have to do is locate where the poles are um, and we can redo the um, integration in terms of uh, the residue.
finding the expansion and finding the a sub minus one value of that expansion gives us the value of that interval uh, on that region. Uh, what I'm going to do uh, later, because we're running out of time, um, and we'll see where we get with Monday. I want you to try the homework. I might extend it because we're a little bit behind, is that uh, we're going to look at uh, intervals now. Um, and they're going to be things like um, what if you have a function of sine and cosine and how we can uh, solve that uh, with the residue uh, function. How uh, can we uh, solve um, functions that look like e to the ix? This is the Fourier transform. Um, and I'll do this. Trying to skip ahead here. And functions that are analytic in um, upper uh, hemisphere or lower hemispheric plane. That is to have a, a coordinate singularity or singularity above or below the plane. Um, obviously, you don't have time to get to that, and I apologize. Um, and since we're running out of time, rather than breaking you out into uh, breakout rooms, um, I just rather uh, we chat. So let me just uh, have my kind of view of this week. Um, this has been more or probably the most uh, abstract part of what we're going to be doing. So we're setting down uh, the guidelines for what we're going to do later. Um, and that's fine. Uh, but it's, it's not quite as satisfying as having a lot of physical examples. So um, I, I understand that. Um, so if what I'd like to hear from you is, um, one, if you have an idea of, of what the main point is, I would like to hear that. But also, two, what is an example that you'd like to see uh, that I can add uh, to Moodle um, over, say, the weekend, over today or the weekend that would help you with some of the, the stuff that we've been talking about? Because I know that this is abstract. So go ahead. And, and then I would like you to write that in the um, reflection part. So there's really just basically two questions this time. I'm assuming that there's something that's confusing about this week. It's a fair assumption. So the question, rather than, than just saying everything's confusing, what's an example you'd like to see? And, and then again, you know, what do you think is the main point of all of this this week? So we got a couple minutes. I'd like to hear some ideas. Does this um, complex analysis apply when we think about something like um, potential wells in, in quantum mechanics and sort of solving for those equations. Is there something we can do with that? Yes. And um, although uh, the example, I do have an example that I'll get to on Monday that has more to do with quantum scattering. So, it, I mean, if you think about where you have encountered complex uh, functions more than anywhere else, it's going to be Schrodinger's equation solutions to that. But yeah. and optics, frankly. And it's okay if there are simple examples. If you'd like to see more examples of expansions, conversions, whatever, that's fine. Just speak up so I know what I can do to help you. Maybe more. That's, I'm sorry. Oh. Go ahead, Uriah. Go ahead. Maybe more of a residue examples. 
Okay. All right. Um, I have um, more, I definitely have more examples of residue calculations, so I can do that. And I'll try and tie that more physically um, in a couple of videos. That's, that's good. Adrian? Yeah, maybe an example of doing one of the contour integrals. Okay. Um, that's, I, I can combine that with one of the things that um, you're going to need for the, whoa. Okay, that's weird. One of the things that you're going to need for one of the homeworks is, Uh, okay, is being able to do uh, the integral sine of x over x from zero to infinity. That's directly related to what we're talking about. Um, and I was going to do that um, in class, but I think what I'll do is I'll just uh, post that as a video. That captures how you do a contour integral, how you deform a contour integral, the way to do this integral is you obviously you have a singularity at the origin and you have a contour that deforms around that uh, singularity uh, and it has a size say delta and maybe um, a size r and the idea is that you expand r to infinity and you shrink delta to zero and Doing that and using the residue theorem, you can actually sh show that this is equal to pi or pi i. No, it's pi. That's right. Is the the shape of the contour made obvious by like trying to do the problem? And if your contour is not the right shape, it'll be obvious that you have the wrong contour. Um, sometimes, but usually not. Uh, the only time that you you might run into problems is if you um, don't go counterclockwise. Okay. If you go count, if you go clockwise, you get a negative value. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes the contour is just um, the easiest contour depends on on the the problem itself. There's nothing that actually prevents you, I guess, in this case, from doing something that looks like that either. As long as you can make the argument that this goes to infinity. And, and then um, as long as the, if this is analytic on this piece, right, then the interval, the interval in question is what? Zero. Is zero, right? And what's neat about this particular problem is that you're going to take apart, you do an expansion of sine of x over x you do an expansion, but since you know that all of this and this and this has to be zero, the only thing that matters is what's going on here as you shrink close down to uh, the singularity. That's, that's kind of what's going to happen with uh, the quantum scattering problem. The quantum scattering problem that I'll do in class has a contour for reasons that I'll explain that looks like that. And actually, what it comes down to is scattering one way or the other. Um, we're over, so any last uh, requests? OK, um, hang in there. Um, we're getting to so, so next week, we're going to be doing Fourier series. So that'll be a little more familiar ground. Um, yeah, and just let me know if you need anything. I miss you guys a lot. The department isn't the same without having you guys around. Um, and I love my house, but I love being in my office with you guys. So uh, I hope you guys are doing well. Let me know if you need anything. And um, yeah, we'll pick it up later. Okay. Bye. Allie didn't say hi, Willa. That's so sad. <laughs>